we're commemorating an event that happened in the month of Maga, which corresponds to February, early March, in the first year of the Buddha's teaching career. This is after he had given the fire sermon and a thousand monks became arahants. After Sariputta and Mughalan had come with their 250 followers and they had all become arahants. On the afternoon of the full moon in Maga, 1,250 monks came to see the Buddha, all arahants. They hadn't been invited. And it was time for the Buddha to send them off to teach. So on that afternoon, he gave them a talk. It's called the Owana Padimokha. We don't have a full record of the talk. All we have is the verse that the Buddha gave at the end as a summary. It's an important event because this is when he laid out the basic teachings. Because even though all those monks had become arahants, many of them had become fully awakened after hearing only one Dharma talk. And the Buddha decided to teach them a full range of teachings from the most basic up to the most advanced as a guide for what they should teach others. So we're paying homage to this event. That's what the word puja means, homage. And as the Buddha said, there are two kinds of homage. There's the homage through material things, amisa puja, as we did just now, taking candles, flowers, incense, circumambulating the hall. That's homage with material things. But that's not the best form of homage, the Buddha said. The best form is to practice. That's how you show homage to the Buddha. Pay honor to his original intention to find awakening, and to all those many, many years in which he followed that intention. He didn't get awakening in order to have people present him with candles, incense, flowers, to circumambulate him. He did it so he could find the way to the end of suffering and teach it to others so they could find the end to, of suffering as well. So putting in his teaching and practice, we're honoring his intention. At the same time, we're benefiting. So focus on your breath, because that's one of the Buddha's teachings. Focus on the breath, and then notice how you breathe in a way that is calming, breathe in a way that's energizing, and see what you need right now. Try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. And after you've been sufficiently energized by whole body breathing, allow it, the breath to grow calm. As we practice, we're not simply practicing and paying homage to the Buddha. We're practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. That means practicing for the sake of dispassion, practicing for the sake of disenchantment that leads to release. In other words, we aim high. But we have to start where we are. As part of that summary, probably the most famous lines or is sometimes called the heart of the Buddhist teachings, the non-doing of any evil, the perfection of what is skillful, and the cleansing of the mind. This is the Buddhist teachings. That's what we're doing for the sake of dispassion. These basic principles apply on every level of the practice when you're practicing the precepts. You have to be very scrupulous. As the Buddha said, you have to see danger in the slightest faults. Because you realize your actions are important. They determine the course of your life. They determine the present moment and on into the future. And if you're going to be sloppy in your, your actions, then your life is going to be sloppy. If you're more meticulous, more scrupulous, more circumspect in how you act,
then the results are going to be more in line with what you would really want. And you're trying to be more and more skillful in your observance of the precepts. Learning to hold the precepts in ways that don't harm anybody. Because there are some times when, when you hold blindly to the precepts, you can create harm. But this doesn't mean you don't hold to them, it means you learn to, how to hold them skillfully. For instance, you know if you have some information that other people would misuse, you do your best to avoid divulging the information. You don't lie about it, but you just don't tell it. That means you have to use your discernment. So you get more and more skillful in how you observe the precepts. And then you cleanse your intentions. Any intention that would go against the precepts, you learn how to say no. To the point where the observing the precepts becomes a non-issue. There's no question. Any intention that would go against the precepts, you immediately say no. That's how you cleanse your mind on that level. The practice of concentration, the same principles apply. Don't let any unskillful thoughts come into the mind. Any thoughts that would pull you away from the breath. And then try to fully develop your skill in how you focus on the breath. There was a monk one time who, when the Buddha said that the monk should practice breath meditation, said, I already practice breath meditation. And the Buddha asked him, well, how do you do that? And the monk said, well, I put aside all, all thoughts of the past, put aside all thoughts of the future, and learn to be equanimous in the present moment, breathing in and breathing out. And the Buddha said, well, there is that kind of breath meditation, but it doesn't get the best results. And he laid out 16 steps. The first four I've already told you, breathing in and out, noticing when the breath is short, when it's long, the effect that it has on the body breathing aware of the whole body, and then calming that effect. The other steps are, include breathing in and out sensitive to pleasure, breathing in and out sensitive to rapture, breathing in and out sensitive to what he called metal fabrication, the way feelings and perceptions shape your mind, and then calming that effect. Breathe in and out sensitive to the mind, and then noticing if the mind is out of balance, what you need to do to bring it into balance, either gladdening it if it's dull, steadying it if it's too restless, releasing it when it's burdened with things. And then there, there are the steps in how you release it. First you pay attention to what's inconstant about what is burdening the mind. And seeing it's in constancy, you also see where it's stressful, where it's not self, where it's not worth holding on to, not worth identifying with. That's how you develop dispassion. From dispassion, there's the cessation of that particular problem, and then you abandon the entire issue. This is a pattern that you follow from the very beginning all the way through. You notice it's very proactive. So it's not just being calm about the breath and putting aside thoughts of the past and the future, you actually sh shape the breath. You learn how to breathe in certain ways that it has a good effect on the mind. So the mind is ready to let go of the things it's been holding on to. It's in this way that developing the skill in your concentration purifies the mind on one level. And then it goes deeper. As you apply the same process to more and more subtle things that are invading the mind, until finally even the state of concentration itself becomes something you want to let go of. That's when your discernment has been avoiding what is unskillful, developing fully what is skillful, and cleansing the mind. So this is why these three principles are called the heart of the Buddhist teachings, because they're useful on all levels of the practice.
so we're scrupulous, not simply for the sake of abiding by rules. It's because we know that if we aren't scrupulous, the mind will find ways of slipping past our attention and getting off the path. We try to fully develop our skills because we learn about the mind in the process. We learn about how the breath has an effect on the mind and then how that effect can be used to train the mind. We're getting more and more sensitive to what's going on in the mind. And that allows us to purify it, to see any place where it's creating unnecessary harm, unnecessary stress, unnecessary disturbance. Seeing why, why we're doing that, and that it's really not worth our while to keep doing those things. And then we let go. Because that's when the mind is fully pure. There was a famous monk in Thailand who one time said that this heart of the Buddhist teachings isn't what the teachings were all about. The ultimate teaching is all about all things are unworthy of attachment, which is true on the final steps of the path. But to get there, you have to follow this heart and apply these principles at all times. Any place where your behavior could be criticized for lack of circumspection, you take it to heart. You're training your internal teacher, so that you're internalizing the Buddha's message by avoiding the slightest harm, trying to develop your skills to the fullest level possible. And that's what's going to cleanse the mind. So this is a teaching that's been passed down from that one afternoon more than 2,600 years ago. And it's good that we remember it every year, even though homage through material things may not be the ideal homage that the Buddha requested, but it is a reminder. The mind does need to have concrete remi reminders every now and then. And the fact that we're the beneficiaries of a long tradition. It's not just us sitting here. As the Buddha said, as long as his teachings are being practiced well, the world will not be empty of arahants. As John Swat once said, that part of the realization of arahantship is that the world has not been empty since the time of the Buddha. In addition, the arahants have been people practicing all along realizing that these teachings are valuable, and passing along to the next generation and the next. Right now we're the beneficiaries of what the previous generations have done. And the best way to pass them on, of course, is to practice. So you're not only paying homage to the past, but you're also setting a good example for the future. And having special days like this helps to remind us that we're all in this together. We have something valuable that's been passed on to us. So we're paying homage not only to the Buddha, but all those who passed it on as we practice. So as you sit and meditate as you practice, remember, you're not alone. It's not just you. There are people before you, and there will be people after you. Sort of try to pass this along intact. By being scrupulous, by trying to develop your skill to the fullest level, and by cleansing and purifying your mind.